much. We're really glad to be here. So thank you so much for inviting us to talk today. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, a whole bunch of research that, uh, that Silver Consulting and Mozilla did together in Brazil. Um, we've done actually a, a couple of projects together in Latin America, but this one is focused on Brazil. And this all is going towards our new mobile platform, Firefox OS. How many people actually know about Firefox OS? All right, nice. Okay, that's a good handful <laughs> of people. Sometimes it's uh, like, oh, I kind of heard about it, not sure. Uh, how many people actually use Firefox as their browser? Yeah, not so much. I'm working on that. <laughs> working on that, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that's a whole other talk. I'm happy to come back and talk about the browser world. Um, but anyway, let's, let's talk about this. So just a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I just want to give you guys a quick background on Mozilla itself. It actually started out as a, as a nonprofit and and has a very rich history in open source and, and a very strong uh, philosophy behind it. And it's embedded in everything we do and all the projects we have. So uh, you're going to need to know a little bit about that to understand why we've done what we've done with the phone. Um, then we're going to talk about Firefox in a nutshell. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of Firefox OS, what it does, what, who our partners are, et cetera. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, or actually a lot about the research. And so, uh, and Brianna and I will talk about that together. Um, if we have time, we'll do a quick demo. I actually have a, a simulation of the phone on my computer, so we'll switch over and do that. I also have a phone. This is not the actual hardware we're using, but it does have the, the latest build on it. So if you want to see that in person, I don't have the ability to do that easily here. So come and find me, and, and you can play with it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do questions. So I expect we'll have about 40 minutes worth of talking, and then questions and answers at the end. I also have some uh, design stuff if you want to see some of the screens. Uh, I have some screenshots of things as well that you can see better from the screen than you will uh, from the simulation. OK, a little bit about Mozilla. So Mozilla is actually, uh, in, in general, Firefox actually came out of the ashes of Netscape way back in the day. When Netscape was purchased by AOL, uh, there were a whole bunch of founders of Netscape that said, yeah, no, I don't want to work for AOL. Walled garden. So what are we going to do? Well, they went off and decided to create Firefox. And that was in 1998. And in 2004, we launched our first browser, which is uh, kind of where you're, you know, if you use Firefox now, it's, that's, the, that's the birthplace of it. And uh, the thing, there's a couple of things you need to know. One is, of course, it's open source. Um, which means that anybody can contribute to it, and it's a very uh, active and large community around Firefox, and which continues today on all of our products, including Firefox OS. And uh, this is important because it's really all about putting the user in charge of your browsing experience. The reason that they didn't want to go work for AOL is because you got AOL at the time, you had Apple, you had Microsoft, and everybody was all about their partners and their advertisers and they were, the, the Mozilla folks were afraid that you were going to be walled into what those advertisers, advertisers wanted you to see. And the, the web is about information, and it's about freedom. So how do we make the freedom of the web put at your fingertips and in your control? Which also means, how do I control the way that people view me, the way people see me? So privacy and security. These are all things that are very much a part of how we do our business every single day. And, uh, and we're going to be talking a lot about this throughout the presentation. So that's why I wanted to give a quick, quick background on that. Um, and it, and it, it's pretty interesting because you come from somewhere like NASA, which has a very strong exploration philosophy. Then you get that you know, it's hard to go other places where there isn't a strong philosophy behind what you do. And so Mozilla was really important for me uh, to have that and, and to have that component. So the manifesto is actually how we do business every day. Okay. So, quick overview, Firefox OS. Firefox OS is, of course, open source and built on the web. It's actually every single piece of Firefox OS is built using CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, which is pretty amazing. Like, when you actually literally call somebody, the dialer built with CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. Pretty amazing. Um, and so everything is also open source, which means it's also been uh, built by not just Mozilla, but then Mozilla's community as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I, I should say, as a caveat, I am not an engineer. 
If you are an engineer and have engineering or tech questions, I will try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. I do have some background knowledge on what the, you know, how the, the actual phone is built, so I can talk to that. But please don't shoot me if I, uh, if I can't answer your question. <laughs> um, yeah, should have mentioned that up front. Uh, okay, so uh, we have right now um, 18 partners that we're working with that were announced in February at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Um, our first partner to the, to the table is Telefonica. They're out of Spain. And, uh, and they, were, they were the first on board, so we've done most of our work with them in conjunction with them. But we also are working with Deutsche Telekom and Telenor, and we're going to go to market with them this year in the following markets. It's a big list, so I'm going to read it. Brazil, Colombia, Hungary, Mexico, Montenegro, Poland, Serbia, Spain, and Venezuela. And that could change as the year goes on. We'll most likely expand that in the fall. But this is all between uh, May, June time frame and September. So you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff happening in the next couple of months. Yeah? What was the name of that period? Telenor, uh, Deutsche Telekom, and uh, Telefonica. And so they're working with different uh, you know, brands that they have, like uh, Telefonica's main brand that we're working with is, uh, actually there's a couple, but Vivo, Movie Star is another one that we're working with under tele, uh, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom. They have Orange and a couple of other ones as well. Um, yeah, so I don't know all the brands underneath them, but um, there's a lot. And then we're, uh, we're working with uh, OEMs as well, so the manufacturers, Alcatel, which is TCL, uh, Huawei, which I can never pronounce, so I'm really sorry if I mispronounce that, uh, LG and ZTE. And then everything is powered by Qualcomm Snapdragon chipset. So those are our partners. So when we get together and actually talk about all the different things we need to do with this phone, that's who's in the room the majority of the time. And so it's a really big set of priorities. And then where's the user, right? Where's the user fit in all that? <laughs> a lot of business priorities, a lot of tech priorities that need to be met, but then we also have to think about where the user fits into that. And that's large part of my job as well as the UX team in general. So who are we targeting? We're actually going after feature phone users in emerging markets. Emerging markets across the world, this isn't just um, in Latin America, which is what we're focusing on today, but the, and, and in particular within emerging markets, we're looking at the middle class, the emerging middle class. Feature phone users, or feature phones, by the way, are those things from back in like 2001, 2002 that flip open and have buttons, maybe slide open. I kind of miss my slide phone. Yeah, thank you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that is a feature phone. Um, and so there are low end smartphones, and then there are smartphones like um, iOS and, and, and uh, the higher end Android. So there's kind of a whole scale of things we're looking at. And we are coming in. Firefox OS is a smartphone. It's priced at a lower end smartphone price to be competitive there, because that's what that, t that group is going to go after. If they're going to go from a feature phone to a smartphone, that's most likely what they're going to go after. So that's where we're looking. Uh, we have more power than a, um, uh, a low end smartphone, and we do more than a low end smartphone, but we're priced kind of like a low end smartphone. OK, so emerging markets. Why? Well, this is where the next 2 billion users are coming from, and we're really focused at, on thinking about how to provide the internet to this group. It's not so much how can we make more money. We're not like that. We actually are a nonprofit. We don't do things to make money. It's really about how can we provide the internet, the free web, to this group. Um, and and we, we believe that mobile is a way that's going to happen for this group. So, Really, we're looking at better how, providing this group of people with better access to information, services, and then one of the biggest requests we get from this group is social media. I want Facebook. That's we heard that. Adriano Galvo, he's one of, from Silver Consulting. He actually conducted our research in Brazil, so he can talk specifically to that. But we pretty much everybody. I want Facebook. How can I get on Facebook, right? Um, and then the cool part about this is that there's going to be a, a nice new um, ecosystem around uh, markets and developers. So this is not just you're going to have new developers coming in, especially local developers coming into the market um, and be part of the, the open source uh, project, and, but, and then also offering goods and services to, to their local markets. But you're also looking at people who may not have ever been a developer before 
who actually can now develop easily because developing a web app is actually a lot easier than developing a native app. So how do you do that? It's going to be a lot easier for people to learn how to do that, and Mozilla is going to be supporting that in different ways, um, not just through providing, you know, buy, you can buy the device and whatever, but also through the community that, we're, that we have. Um, so it's pretty cool. Developers are very excited about it. I'm very excited about it. So um, where are we going? Most of our partners, and I'm sorry, this is really text heavy, so you can just listen to me talk about it. Um, basically, all of the places we're going in the world are really a combination of factors, but it's a decision between our partners and Mozilla. Um, as I mentioned, Telefonica being the first partner, uh, they were really, really interested in, in Brazil, and in particular, the, the middle class in Brazil. So that's where we said, yeah, that sounds good to us. We, we like Brazil. That, that would be a good place for us to go. It's a very interesting up, up and coming uh, market. And we want to be in Latin America in general. And where else would you start but Brazil? So that sounds great. And so we actually spent 2012 focusing on Brazil and with Silver Consulting. They made, basically made that happen for us. And, um, and we also did some user testing in, with them as well <laughs> in Brazil and Colombia. And we plan on going back this year to Colombia to do some more work. Um, this year is also focused on Central Europe. So in particular, Poland and Hungary. And those are our partners, Te Deutsche Telekom and Telenor. Uh, again, middle class, um, feature phone users looking to upgrade to smartphone users, same thing. We're actually headed out into the field next week. Um, and we'll be going to, uh, you know, s focusing on Central Europe and, and, and potentially Spain later in the year, and then we'll see. The fall, we will see. I'm, I'm, I, who knows? Um, so that's where we are. So why even do research in market? I mean, that's kind of a silly question for me to even ask myself because that's what I do for a living. But this is the first time that Mozilla has ever <laughs> stepped back and said, whoa, we really have no idea who our users are now. You know, we're in Silicon Valley. If you've spent time in Silicon Valley, uh, it's a bubble. It's a very lovely bubble, <laughs> but it is a bubble. Um, you know, we walk around with all the, the latest tech gadgets. You know, the billboards on the highways as you're driving literally have code on them, and I am not kidding. <laughs> they have code on them. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we, we can't just design for ourselves anymore. And I think we have had a history of doing that in the past. Um, that's changing. And, but, you know, we couldn't do it this time. There's no way. And it was pretty clear as the, as the team started the project about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, um, the prioritization of how they were developing the project, um, it just wasn't working. They, they weren't sure what they should focus on. You know, we focus on these features. What about these features? You know, they wanted certain priorities because that's what they wanted out of their phones. Well, do people use smartphones in the same way? We don't know. Uh, my guess is no, right? So wh what do we do about that? So we need to know not just usage, but then we also need to know things like strategies around money and communication and family structures. Where does the mobile phone fit into all of that? How are you going to make a decision about which phone to buy? What are you going to do in the store? Where do you even go? That was actually something we, we learned quite, quite uh, quickly when we were in Brazil, is that not everybody goes to a carrier store and buys a phone. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't. Well, crap, if we're only you know, selling our phone in a carrier store, what are we going to do? So these are all questions that we needed to answer. So that's why we talked to Silver who has a whole bunch of experience in Brazil across, as well as across the world in emerging markets. This, they're kind of the, my go-to group to work with in general, but also for, particularly for emerging markets. So I'm going to turn it over to Brianna, and she's going to talk about what we did. OK, well, I will uh, just introduce a little bit here. So <clears throat> Silver Consulting is an innovation research and strategy firm. We're actually located literally just a few blocks from here at Payne and Dewey. Um, and so as Corey has mentioned, we, we have offices both obviously here in Evanston and then uh, another office in Brasilia, Brazil. Uh, so we do a lot of work in Brazil. Um, we initially started our office in Brazil because of a, a bunch of government work that we were doing there. Um, but as you can see from this map, this is a map that basically shows all the countries that we've done research in before. Um, and much of the work that we've done has been around the emerging 
the emerging middle class, middle class consumer. Um, so one of the challenges that we had coming into this project obviously was we needed to bring and help to bring this understanding to Mozilla of what is the Brazilian middle class consumer. And so very different from who, who these people were that were developing, that were developing the phone already. And so one of the things that we had to do is, is one, what, what is the middle class consumer of Brazil, but how does that differ and how does that compare from the middle class consumer in America and basically drive home the point that it doesn't. And so <laughs> this uh, first couple uh, pictures will give you a sense of this. So this is obviously uh, middle class America street. You know, probably something pretty typical to what you see. Actually, some typical thing that you might see right outside here. Now, this is what middle class Brazil looks like, a typical street. So very different. Likewise, probably a typical middle class America kitchen. You know, nothing luxury, pretty basic. This is what one looks like in Brazil. Half of the kitchen's outside. Again, another middle class America bedroom, lots of Ikea. <laughs> this is what that looks like in Brazil. So very different. So we needed to basically understand what middle class Brazil looks like, understand those values and the motivations and how that might impact Brazil, but then also once that, once that data came back to the home office, be able to share that information and have people accept that. And there was a slight bit of pushback, but people eventually came around. Um, so as Corey mentioned, what we're here to really talk about and kind of give more context to was the, was the exploratory in-context research that we've done in Brazil. And we've done you know, a fair amount of usage testing since then, but it's this exploratory work that really set, I would say, the, the major design constraints around the design of the phone. Um, so this research was conducted in two markets. The first was Sao Paulo. And so for those not familiar, Sao Paulo is the largest city in Brazil, and it's actually one of the largest cities in the entire world. So if you think New York City is dense, it's nothing in comparison to Sao Paulo. <laughs> um, it'll take you two hours to drive like two miles. The next uh, city was Recife, and this is very different. You can tell even just from the photo here. This is a coastal city. It's in the northern part of the country. We chose these two markets for, 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 two, for a reason, because the cultural values of this region of Brazil are very different from, from that in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is very much of a, you know, it's more of a, it, it's a work culture, first of all, but it's in the southern, side of, southern part of, of Brazil. And so there's just a different, different type of population that's there, whereas up in the northern part of the, 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 the nation, you get a lot of indigenous populations and a lot of the, the values and beliefs change related to that. So we went into people's home. This was definitely an eth ethnographic research type of endeavor. And so we went into people's home with, with a, a protocol that wanted to cover a variety of different topics. So this is actually Adriano here. Um, with one of our participants where we, you know, in this particular shot is basically, you know, we wanted to understand what did their home look like? What, what are the things that they really prized within their home? We did an exercise where we asked them to, before the research, where we asked them to take pictures of the most valued objects and things. We asked for material possessions on, on purpose. So the most valued things that they had. And then we asked them to also share the, the things that they aspire to gaining. Um, and then, you know, basically through that, got a sense of who, who are they, what makes them tick, what are the strategies that they have around money, um, you know, what is the role of a mobile phone in comparison to everything else that they may have in their life. Um, we obviously went pretty deep into, into their mobile phones, and so this is a collage of four different images uh, from participants. And, you know, we'll come back to this point in a minute. But I want you to take particular note to the, to the image up on the, on the top left corner. Your people have three phones. Those are all the phones of the same individual. So people, it's not uncommon for people to have multiple phones and to carry those multiple phones on them at any given time. I also want to direct your attention to this one here on the, on the right um, because you can see multiple SIM cards there. So we really wanted to obviously understand you know, what are those different mobile phones that people are using? How do they use them? When do they decide when to use one phone versus another? All those types of things. 
We also wanted to understand what kind of brand equity did Firefox have within the Brazilian community and especially amongst this middle class consumer where for many of them, they've never had the idea of having a, a consistent sort of at your finger type access to internet doesn't exist for many of them. Uh, we've talked to some people who literally traveled an hour to like a, a, a father's house once a week to jump on the internet. Um, so the idea of this being a brand, you know, was it a brand that was consistently within their frame of reference and something that if, if Mozilla came out and branded the phone Firefox, would people know what that was? So we're going to basically spend the rest of the presentation telling you about some of the the key takeaways and then also from the research and then what the implications of those key takeaways were for the development of, of the Firefox OS device. So the four key takeaways were that prepaid is preferred. So and that's in contrast to you know, postpaid plans that typically we might have here in the US. SIM swapping is just a way of life. So you need to be able to somehow, somehow allow for that to happen. Talking and texting are just as important as the internet, um, if not more important, at least at this, at this stage in the adoption cycle. And then that the mobile infrastructure in emerging, emerging markets, and particularly, they just, they just suck, basically. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? So this first, uh, first key takeaway around prepaid is preferred. To really get the context of this, I have to take a step back for a minute and talk about just money. So a little bit of context around the emerging middle class of Brazil. The purchasing power of this class, because, you know, that's why it gets its emerging name, is that it's growing. And growing quite, quite dramatically. Uh, it represents more than 50% of the population today. And so the way people deal with money is there's a whole system, there's both informal and formal ways of gaining credit for the, for the middle class. The formal ways is literally you may, you may it's very typical to purchase even a pair of jeans, for instance, on kind of a credit installment plan. So if you want to go get a pair of jeans, and let's say the, the jeans are 100 hay eyes, you may spend 10 hay eyes per month over the course of 10 months to buy, this per, to buy this pair of jeans. And you walk out that day with a pair of jeans, but you're paying for the jeans for 10 months. Now, hopefully the jeans still are good <laughs> 10 months later, but you're paying for them over that. And you pay for everything this way, from razors, to uh, you know, sneakers, to washing machines, you know, if you want to buy something for your home. Are they paying interest on it as well? In some cases, and in some cases, no. So um, I guess technically, yes, always. However, there are ways, in, if you go into a merchant, they will oftentimes have an avista price, which is, means if you put all the money down right now, it's this price. If you don't put all the money down and it, you paid in these installments, then it's, then it's this price. However, there's lots of merchants where they don't distinguish. You know, if you're going to pay a visa, they're like, it's still the same amount. So there is a lot of negotiating power. If you walk into a shop and say you want to buy that pair of jeans, and, it, and it's always advertised as 10 by 10, um, if you, if you want to buy that pair of jeans and you have cash, you can say, well, I'll offer you 80 hay eyes for that pair of jeans. And they may take it, or they'll say, Oh, you can get it for 90. You know, so there's a little bit of negotiating power if you pay Avista in most cases. How do you always make this show No, so this is the interesting thing is you pay for it then. Like so if you've got a credit card, they they will basically they don't charge the whole hundred hay eyes at that time and then you pay it off like we would here in this country because people don't have the credit limits to support that. So what they will do is they'll just basically put your name on a tab, and every month, at the start of the month, they'll run 10 hay eyes. Or if you use checks or something like that, then, then they'll, you basically pre-write the check, and then they'll cash the check at the start of every, at the start of every month. Um, so everything is purchased in this way, and that's more the formal credit type of perspective. Then you've also got informal credit. Now, you're never going to go to your aunt and ask her for a pair of jeans unless you literally have nothing to wear. Like, that's not the type of uh, um, purchases you're going to get from an informal, familial type of perspective. But like, let's say your washing machine goes out. You may go to your aunt and say, can I borrow money? Or can I use your credit card, which has a higher credit limit, to purchase my washing machine? Or we also saw a number of people in the research where they were doing home improvements. 
And even somebody who might not be living in the house was actually contributing to the home improvement and putting money into the pot to enable that. Um, so when you take all of this aspect of how people sort of think about money, how they're tracking money, you know, how they're weighing which is a, an appropriate ask of money from a family member, and now you sort of bring it back to the mobile world, prepaid is really winning out because they have a lot more control around money, or perceivably they have a lot more control around their money in a prepaid option. Um, because if you've all been in the situation where maybe you've gone to another country, I did this recently where I, I called Canada, and I didn't even think about it. And then all of a sudden I have a $30 extra charge on my, on my bill because I called Canada for 10 minutes, you know? And you kind of go over and you get the surprise bill and you're like, oh, darn it, you know? Well, the thing is, is, uh, you know, minutes and data are really expensive in Brazil. So even going over a little bit can set you back in a big way from a financial perspective. So that's why people like prepaid. Because literally if the minutes are gone and the data's gone, and they don't have the money to pay for anymore. They just shut the, f they just shut the phone shut down. The phone off. And then they don't have a phone for a week until they get more money. Yep. So where is, what's the impact of this to Mozilla? I'll turn it back over to Corey. Sure. OK, so this is, a, this is a tricky topic for us because we've got partners, as I mentioned. And partners have their own businesses. And they're very powerful partners. Um, and they really, really were focused on postpaid. You know, how, how, and, and by the way, postpaid means monthly bill. Um, and that you pay after the fact. And so what we were coming back to the field with, and by the way, they had their own researchers coming back with the same data, which really was a great thing to have both sides coming back with the same data saying, yeah, we're going to do this. It's got to have both options. And so they finally said, okay, let's do this with, a, with a, both a prepaid and a postpaid situation, which really, I think, makes a huge difference for us at Mozilla because I think it's going to help the adoption process a lot better. Because if you came forward and said, well, that's a postpaid situation. I'm not really ready for that kind of commitment. I don't know what data means. How do you manage data? How do you track that? I know what texts mean. I know what you know, calling means. I know how to understand my minutes. But I don't understand this other thing. How am I going to do this? So really, this is a great uh, opportunity for us to be able to capture the people who were, who, who were not going to come on board because of a postpaid. So, um, so this is a great thing. This is kind of a big win for us across the board. So now we'll go to the, the second key takeaway here. So remember, I had asked you to kind of keep this photo of the, of the phone with two, two SIM cards here. So SIM, car, uh, SIM swapping is just a way of life in Brazil. Um, people have multiple phones and they have multiple carriers. And again, it all comes back to money. You know, they know how to manage money in very creative ways. And so it comes back to money. And this is why also prepaid is really valuable because that means you can have multiple carriers. You're not stuck to one. So, you know, you've got here in the, the orange logo here is an OI carrier and the blue one is, is, is what they call CHEAM. And so, you know, let's say I want to call Corey, and Corey has OI. Well, we may have like, you know, friends and family type of plan where I can either call Corey at a reduced rate or maybe even call her free. So whenever I call Corey, I'm going to call her on OI because she has OI. I'm not going to call her on CHEAM because it's going to cost me more money. And so people will have literally like three, four carriers so that they can swip in, swap in and out these SIM cards so that they can kind of game the system. And everybody knows, everybody knows who everybody has. So if, like, let's say Corey's in my address book, I know that Corey is, is OI because she's a good friend of mine, but I actually label in my address book Corey OI so I don't screw up. <laughs> Wouldn't Corey also have multiple SIM cards? Like, I wish. Know she she would. Right? We talk about it. You, okay. you know who your friends are. Like, usually it's like, my, my, this is what we saw all the time in Brazil. Well, my mom's on Vivo, or my mom's on this, so that you have that no matter what, because you're going to talk to your mom. Um, but you know who your friends are, and you know what they have. So you, know, you also probably know that they have the same ones you do. So if you call Anna, or if I call Brianna, and I know that she's on Claro and Oi, I, and I have Claro and Oi, it doesn't really matter. I, there's less swapping to do unless there's some really good deal 
that, that we have for some reason. So yeah, it's, it, there's a lot to manage when it comes to the swapping. Yeah, I guess my question would be just like, do they call them and say like, hey, are you on your oil what now? Like, oh, take it there's a, switch. that's a great question. People work out different situations. Usually it's a, I'm gonna ring for, you call once, let it ring one time and hang up. That's kind of like the signal of, hey, I'm calling you. You can see that it's so-and-so. So you're like, okay, let me swap out that SIM card or switch it over or, or maybe I need to call them. So uh, yeah, so there's all, you usually work out signals with people and they're very elaborate sets of signals and they're, and they're different depending on who you are. And the other thing that it, that's important to understand as far as how people manage money, in, in Brazil, when somebody calls you, it doesn't deduct minutes from your own plan. So like in the US, if two people are talking, it deducts minutes from both of your plans. It doesn't happen that way in Brazil. So you can shut off your phone, it technically is in terms of calling other people, but they can still call you. And that's why this whole like, you know, I'm gonna ring and then call and then, you know, wait two minutes while you switch out your SIM card and then I'll call you back, yeah. <laughs> works. So, so what this really means is that we need to make an easy way to manage multiple SIMs. I should mention this up front is that Firefox OS does not have multiple SIM slots. We are only doing one SIM, which was a big, conversation to have when we came back from the field and we were like, hey, everybody wants multiple SIMs. How do we do this? And we may do this in the future. Um, but for now, we are one SIM. So really, it's all about managing easily. So what, what we came up with was a really good way to manage your contacts that makes it easy for you to manage multiple SIMs um, and, and phone numbers for multiple SIMs so you don't have to keep remembering. And by the way, since this stuff is all prepaid, if you let your prepaid number run out, your number's gone, which also means you're swapping not just the SIMs and knowing all this, but you, your friends might be swapping numbers often. So you have to keep track of that as well. So this is a good way to do it. Instead of having, we, one of the requests that kept coming up for us was, uh, hey, can you make a, uh, you know, my request would be making your contact list like 500 entries long. <laughs> and Andre's, Andreano was like, why 500? Why 300? We heard that 300 a lot as well. Well, you know, because I have multiple entries for one person. So you have Ana Oi, Ana Claro, Ana Chim, Ana Vivo, Ana Old. I mean, who knows? You have five Anas. They're all the same person. Why not just make it Ana and then have everything underneath that? So that's the way we decided to manage that for, for now until we, you know, for one sim and, and, and just keep it at one sim. The other nice thing about having one sim, it, it, what we found out as well, is that Battery life lasts a lot longer with one SIM. If you have a phone with multiple SIMs, you're also carrying around multiple batteries because the running multiple SIMs, especially if it's an easy swap one where you're not physically changing things, you are running your battery down. So people are carrying multiple phones, multiple batteries. It's kind of like you just need a pack for just the phones. So, um, so this should help kind of solve those problems as well. So moving to the third point here, <coughs> talking and texting is just as important as the internet. So just to kind of refresh everybody, for many people in, this, in the mi middle class of Brazil, having, having access to internet on a daily basis is not the reality of their daily life. And certainly not necessarily in their home. They may have access to it at work, they may have access to it at a library or something like that, but definitely not in their home. And so, you know, this is in very stark contrast to, let, let's say, the, the developers and the engineers in, at Mozilla. And, you know, I would, I would largely say many of the people, you know, it's definitely a big difference from a cultural perspective than here in the U.S. Um, but definitely different for the engineers and, and the designers at, at Mozilla. And so, you know, talking and texting is still really, really important. And so, <laughs> this diagram off to the right here, it gives a sense of basically, you know, when we started to look at the values and the behaviors of, of the middle class in Brazil, and then how that mapped then to the types of things that they might want to do on the phone, this, this diagram encapsulates that. So at the core, people just on a bare bones expect their phone to deliver good call and text quality. So it needs to, they need to be able to hear what the other person's saying on the other, on the other side of the phone. And it also needs to have a really a high play factor. And so one of the things that we saw a lot of people using their phone for, which was surprising, is they watch TV on their phone. I had never seen a phone with a TV on it <laughs> before, this, before this research. 
but it's a full-fledged TV on the phone. It even has a little antenna that comes up. Um, they listen to the radio on their phone, and then they play games. And so, you know, when we ask, well, what do you want out of the phone? Those things were just bare bones. Like they expected that to be on the phone. Um, some of the things that people are asking for that we think will that will be one of the delights basically of the Firefox OS dev device is they want to be able to download things. So they want the variety. They want to be able to download music. They want to be able to download games. They want to be able to, um, you know, download potentially even you know video content, but. They want to be able to do it cheaply. <laughs> um, but right. they want to be able to download it. Um, and they want to be able to do it in a way that's not super time intensive as well. And they really want to share. So going back to what Corey was saying around social media, you know, Facebook, is, I mean, I believe that, that Brazil is one of the most uh, you know, fastest growing markets for Facebook. And people want to be able to do that type of stuff. Um, but right now, their access to the internet just it doesn't enable this um, because even a lot of times when they are getting on the internet, it's not a fast connection, and so some of these some of these things are just they can't even do it. Like downloading a game would take hours or days um, on some of the some of the connections that they have. Now, some of the other stuff in this Aspire bucket, you know, the, the whole idea of creating content, it's a bit of a stretch for what we believe this this user will be able to do right now. So this is more like. V3 and beyond uh, for Mozilla, where you know most of the t the types of things we're talking about there are like productivity tools around like calendaring and notebooking, and not to say that people aren't going to go there, they probably will, but you know they're not going to go there yet because they still have to go here and understand what that really looks like before they're going to actually get there. Yeah. So this is a really big uh, kind of a of a challenge for us to come back with because uh, you know if you think about it the way we are we're smartphone centric and especially in Silicon Valley everybody's carrying around smartphones and really what it is it's a computer that just happens to call people that you probably never use as a phone anymore you know you, if you text that's probably it maybe you take a phone call here and there most likely you're using it as a computer right do my email do my calendaring sync my data get my stuff listen to my music right that's that's the way the developers uh, were thinking about prioritization in terms of what features we're going to get built first. Let's do the cool stuff. Let's do the calendar. Let's, by the way, a lot of that stuff's in the phone. It happened. Um, what we were saying is don't ignore the other stuff. This isn't going to sell if it doesn't have text. If you don't have MMS and SMS, it's not going to go off the shelves. If you don't have a good radio, they were like, a radio? Are you kidding me? We got, we got a whole music player. No, radio. And we're like, and by the way, how about throwing a TV in? And they're like, what? A TV? Are you kidding me? And we're like, yeah, because it doesn't, it's free. It doesn't need data plan to do that. Free. And then we literally showed pictures of the antenna, which uh, is right here. TV, antenna. It's amazing. And they were like, oh, there are phones that have antennas? Where can I get one? <laughs> right? I want TV. <laughs> they all used to have antennas. <laughs> but it's for a TV. Holy crap. What are we going to do about that? So this really helped the, the teams prioritize um, and, and actually reprioritize. And this is a really big challenge because we did this very, very late. We actually did this research in August. They had already been down the road. Half the stuff was already built. We had to reprioritize in August. We are delivering now. So from August until now, until code freeze, which was, uh, uh, you know, we had a couple code freezes, but January was our first major code freeze. So August to, to January, not that long. And they had to reroute everything. And so we actually did. We, did a, we, we, did, we improved uh, SMS and, and, and MMS. We actually uh, built a better radio and an interface for a radio, which the designers loved doing. It was a lot of fun. Um, we decided not to focus so much on, uh, on things like notes and note taking and, and voice recording, because that wasn't something that people were doing. And then instead focus on something that was important, which was Bluetooth transfer. They're like, you know what, Bluetooth, that's old school. We need to Bluetooth maybe a headset, but why would we Bluetooth transfer stuff? It's like, well, because it's free. And because that's how people are doing things now, and they like it. And if we don't have that capability, we may not go off the shelves. How are we going to do that? So they actually rerouted, and they did that. So now that's in the phone as well. And we do have calendaring. We do have email. Those things are all there as well. Um, but the rollout plan for how that was going to happen got, got completely changed because of the research. Yeah? Is TV broadcast digital or analog? Um, 
believe it is analog. Yeah. But don't quote me on that. I believe it is analog. Um, and then just so, so you can see, there's a little TV sign here, and that's another TV one. This is actually uh, the music player from the phone. This is my music, actually, from, from the simulator, so I'll show that in, in a little bit. Um, so you can see the different, the different things that we actually built out based on priorities. Okay. And so the last, uh, the last point here is that the mobile infrastructure in market just, just sucks. And so basically, you know, if you think about the mobile infrastructure, and you remember back, if you had a smartphone then, the, that, you know, Edge and 3G and how painful that was to get online, that's basically what's being, what's available currently in market. And just in general, in internet in general, is just pretty in, unstable and just inconsistent in market amongst all classes. It doesn't matter which class you're in. Um, it's very common on a daily basis for the internet to go down, um, even, in, even if it's a hardwired connection, um, or, and then just inconsistent speeds altogether. Um, and so that kind of culture around the internet, and then coupled with you know, sort of an edge or 3G type of speed, you know, that was a major constraint and a major aha for, for Mozilla when you know, the initial design of this phone was designed to be connected to, connected to the internet, you know, 24-7, all the time. So I'll turn it over to Corey to talk about how they've dealt with this gracefully. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is hard. We knew we had to do this uh, already. But to the extent at which we were going to have to support this, that was the, the surprise. So, um, you know, we're a web phone. We're, we're a platform based on the web, right? So this is all about being online all the time. How do you handle offline work? And what is the extent of what offline work actually means? I mean, yeah, sure, we know that certain apps work while you have your phone off and you can do certain things. You might be able to write an email and save it, maybe not send it. That sure, there, there was stuff there that we knew we had to do. But people at Mozilla didn't understand how, how people were thinking about getting online. It was like, oh, you just connect to Wi-Fi. Oh, this also has to do a lot with like downloads. How do you update your phone? You know, what's that going to be like? By the way, it's free updates um, via data plan. We were like, oh, you, they'll just go to a Wi-Fi hotspot and they'll do this. It's like, what are you talking about? You're going to stand at a Wi-Fi hotspot forever to download your, your or to update your phone? It's not going to happen. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, so really, we needed to think about a, the, the smartest ways to handle, handle this. And a lot of it comes down to, uh, to caching data locally. So there's a couple things we do. It's all about static resources handled locally. You've got, um, uh, you know, lo we, we load content and, and, or data asynchronously. And then uh, there's, there's deep linking. And, uh, and of course, we are, uh, handle connectivity loss pretty gracefully, which basically means it's not you know, like you're just going to get a dial that goes like this. There will be um, cues in the interface, built into the interface, that when you lose connectivity, you know you've lost connectivity. And it's going to ask you, maybe, depending on what you're doing, do you want to save this? Uh, maybe it grays out. There are different things that it does depending on your, your activity. So uh, you're always going to know what's going on. And the other thing that, that we saw was that people, people with, their, with their feature phones, that if they had access to the internet, like it was a, not the true internet, it's just like a WAP internet, um, you're really looking at people getting online really quickly, you know, they go up, they do their one thing, and then they turn it off. And so I'm, we are expecting that pattern of behavior to remain the same until people get used to having, uh, understanding what data actually means and, and having a way to, uh, you know, manage their data plan. So if you see this thing over here on the right, this is actually something that Telefonica was very interested in building and basically made it a requirement, which we were like, this is perfect. We give users more data. That's awesome. Um, about their data. So really what, it, what it, we did was we built a, a usage report uh, app together. The two UX teams actually did it together. And so it, it counts your, uh, manages your, your minutes, your messages, as well as your data. So you can actually visualize that data. And it, and it, it views it in different ways. You know, this is all the data you did on Wi-Fi. This is all the data you did on um, the, the network. It, you understand what you have left. Uh, it helps you visualize that, hey, a movie is going to, you may know in your head, a movie's bigger 
data amount than in downloading that than doing an email, but you may not understand that 50 emails looks like this versus two, versus a text, versus a song. People don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that looks like, you know, because I have, I have whatever un, unlimited plan that I have, whether it's unlimited or not, I don't really know. But uh, I have that, so I don't pay attention to that. But when you're prepaid, you are totally paying attention to that. So how do you manage that? And that's what we built, it's a, and it's an app. Um, do we have time? Oh, yeah. OK. Have just a um, we have like, we're just at we 47 minutes. So we're doing pretty good. Um, are people excited about seeing a demo? Should we see a demo? OK. And like I said, I have, I have the phone here, so we can um, you can come up and look at it later. Um, sorry, this is a little bit. You're good. Okay, good. Let me flip this around a little bit here. Okay, so this is, I don't know, you guys can't see this, but this is on lock screen. You flip it up and then you unlock it like that. So there you go. There's that one. This is mine. Um, there's a couple of changes in this. In, in, I have the latest build, so this looks a slight, slightly different than this one. You've got your typical call, very standard. You've got text. I mean, it's, I, sorry, I don't have anything already pre-filled in there to show you. It looks like little bubbles, of course, typical texting. These are the contacts we were talking about earlier. So if you go to Anna, you've got Anna, Claro, Oi, Chim. You know, you can, you can link up photos and you can talk, of, um, you know, list as a favorite. You can do all sorts of other linking with uh, your address book and other contacts. You can talk about, I didn't even fill out half the stuff that's on here. You know, address, email, uh, do they work at a company? Um, you can decide how to label mobile versus work versus home versus whatever. Um, typical contact kind of stuff, but so you can see that. And then you swipe to the right, and you've got your, there's a camera, you've got, here's the radio. Th this one doesn't have anything uh, pre-programmed in, um, because it's, it usually pulls from the internet or wherever you are locally. It'll just pull in your radio stations. And then you can uh, favorite. You can see, if you see the star here, uh, you really can't see it too well. You can favorite radio stations so that you always have them. Why can't you have your apps on the home page? Oh, <laughs> that's an excellent question. That is a complete design choice. Uh, that we made in conjunction with Telefonica at the time. They felt that they wanted to keep it crisp and clean and kind of low key. I think that's not gonna go very far, personally. I think everybody wants their apps. <laughs> we'll see what happens. That's an easy change to make, but that's what we started out with. And we, believe me, the UX team spent a lot of time talking about that. <laughs> so it was a design choice. There is no other reason for that. By the way, you can pin to the actual home screen if you want to. Yeah, once you customize. And you can change the photos and all, do all the customizations and add in all sorts of stuff, yeah. Yeah, did I see another question? Okay. So, hey, we have yeah. a question here. Yeah. So, you, you mentioned like um, the spotty things that we have on the internet. Mm -hmm. So, how would you handle like the crucial phone numbers? Because if your phone, if you lose connected, you might know that you have like firmware issues. Yes, excellent question. Um, so, well, like I said, Okay, Pete, it. Uh, it's how do you handle updates um, when you're doing an update and you lose connection, connectivity? Um, so you're less likely to lose connectivity using the, the, the actual um, uh, network, not a Wi-Fi hotspot, right? So, mo so because we have made agreements with all of our partners that it's free to do any updating, um, then we, you should be using the, the network to do that. It will be slower, potentially, depending on the time of day or where you are. Some places have really great 3G speeds. Some places are uh, 2G and below. And if you, if you ever look at your phone and it says E, that's the edge network. That's like old school, right? That's a very typical thing, actually, in, in uh, Brazil and other countries. So that's the speed you're looking at. So you're going to stand there a little bit. So our problem wasn't so much the connectivity loss, but it was more like the speed at which you get your, your upload. Because who wants to just stand there or set the phone down for two hours? and some, up, uh, some updates are bigger than others, so how are we going to package that? So um, that is a great question. I don't know the tech specs behind how that is happening, but we have, um, we have handled that such that if you stop an update, it won't, you won't lose what you've already updated. So it doesn't mean that it won't, it won't activate right away, so you have to activate the update somehow. So you can finish the entire upload, then it will update the phone for you, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. Uh, long, long term, how do you guys see yourselves fitting in the competitive OS market? Like versus Android and iOS? Mm -hmm. What's the strategy? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So the question is, what's the strategy for long-term uh, competitiveness with Android and iOS? Most likely, we at some point, we will probably enter into emerged markets, so the US, Europe, Canada, to really take on um, you know, sophisticated smartphone users. That won't be for a while. We're really focused on emerging markets. Um, right now, uh, our strategy is to think about um, the relationship between um, Firefox and the user, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, privacy and security and the way that we develop uh, open source, it actually allows a lot more development to be happening locally in terms of apps. So you should actually have a lot more of a local ecosystem and availability of really cheap or free apps that are local to where you are. Um, so that, I think, is going to be an interesting advantage for, for Firefox OS compared to um, compared to uh, Android and iOS. And in terms of iOS, we're not, like a lot of iOS doesn't even, well, we'll see what they do. But right now, they don't even play in, this, in these markets because people can't afford those phones. In Brazil, an iPhone right now, like an older iPhone, not even the brand new iPhone, it's like $1,000. So people in this group aren't, they may aspire to that, but they can't afford it. So what we really, so our main competitor then ends up being Android. Um, and so I think that what we can bring to the table are good plans, good partners, um, better hardware potentially, although Samsung is quite well respected in that group um, in Brazil. Uh, and then I think this developer ecosystem, which is a little bit different. So your apps could be cheap or free. And right now apps are not that cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do you get apps by YouTube or do you have to download all of them? Um, you would typically go to our marketplace, which is actually, I can show you the marketplace, it's right here. Um, and this is just a little sample marketplace. Um, you can go there and download the apps from there. Uh, you could Bluetooth an app. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Given that Android mostly um, had your MIT lessons, why didn't you start from there? Why didn't we start from there? Yeah, why'd you start from there? Oh, uh, that's an excellent question, and I don't know if I can answer that. That might be above my technology chops. Um, but most likely, I, I, I'm going to say is that we already have a platform, a web platform. It's called Gecko, and that's what Firefox is based on. So what we did is we took Gecko, and we moved it over, and we built, rebuilt it for mobile usage. And then we layered uh, the UI layer on top of it. It's called Gaia. And that's what you actually see and what you interface with. And then the, the kernel that's below it is called Gonk. And so we did rebuild the kernel. Yeah. So, um, there, so the bulk of the reason is, is most likely open source. Um, we wanted everything to be free and open. And there are pieces of Android that are not. There are proprietary pieces of code within Android at the base levels. So what pieces they are, I don't know. <laughs> but there are. Yeah. But we have it. Oh, sorry. We're, we're, question over next? here. Okay, yes. Branding the phones, Mozilla, and how do you get credit for those? How do you, get, how do you actually get credit for your uh, technology, for your consumers? If you are a credit for, if you're a develop, if you're a contributor, you mean? No, as Mozilla, do you get credit from the consumers? Like, you, like I saw your yeah. interface, there's no Mozilla branding. No, anymore yeah, anymore it's Firefox, yeah. So most, interestingly enough, um, depending on where you are in the world, and in Brazil this was true, People did know that it, Firefox was Mozilla. They actually said, oh, Mozilla Firefox, just as they would say Google Chrome, just as they would say Microsoft Internet Explorer. So the, the, the brands were attached to the, the, the kind of the motherships, you know, the home brand. Um, but no, we decided to, to, to specifically say um, Firefox. As a matter of fact, I think, well, I'll go back to it. I do, there are places where it does say Mozilla at the bottom of things, but it will be branded Firefox OS. So how do we get credit? Um, I think that Firefox as a brand is actually probably stronger than Mozilla as a brand. And so uh, we'll, we'll ride on those coattails um, if we have to. I think uh, Mozilla as an organization is not too worried about that. So the more we can elevate Firefox, whether it's the browser or OS, it's, it's fine with us. And uh, there was one over here, and then I'm coming back. Yeah. Uh, what would you want to prefer to use uh, Firefox OS than to use Android? So why choose Firefox OS? 
over others? Well, I guess it depends on what you like. Are, are you talking from, from why should somebody in this room choose it or why should somebody in the target market choose it? Okay, great questions. Um, most likely, we are going to uh, be cheaper depending on which uh, brand of Android phone you're talking about. Um, we also are, uh, since we're partnering with, uh, we have a couple different ways we're partnering. Um, we have partnerships with developers and large uh, um, social media partners like Facebook and Twitter and other things. So those things will, will be built um, and, and on, delivered on the phone. Uh, we, we would know them as native apps. Uh, this is a cool part. I should have explained this, and I, I have a visualization for it. Let me see if I can pull it up really quickly. Um, can you guys see that? Yeah. Let me see if I can. Yeah. So this is a cool thing about the web as a platform, and I didn't go through this earlier. Um, the way that OSs work now, like Android, you know, you've got your native apps, and then you've got the browser, and then you've got web apps that sit within the, within the browser, which is, if you know, on a, on a phone is a really small space to do anything cool. But the way the Firefox OS works is that the platform is a browser OS, right? And it is a browser. So your web apps become the bulk of the space. So really, that's what you're looking at. If you look at a traditional browser, all the good stuff, all the content is here, right? That's the content of your phone, which means it's super easy to develop for it. So all the people that have apps currently, they're gonna, it's a lot, very, very easy for them to take their current stuff and swift, just kind of switch it over to HTML and, and, and be able to use it. Um, and, uh, and so you're going to see a lot, like I said, a lot, a lot more local stuff, homegrown stuff. And in these markets, that's actually really important. Community... Um, and where you live and localness is very, very important. So you're going to see a lot of that coming up. So I think that's a big bonus to the phone. You're also going to, since it's so easy to develop for the phone, I think you're going to see a lot of entrepreneurs come online as well. Um, that's not so much a value proposition for the user, but I do think that's going to be an end result. And that's going to take a little bit of time as well. We're well priced. We have good partners in, um, from the app world. We have really good partners um, for the data pr um, plans. So all the carriers. And uh, they're well-respected brands in the, in the communities as well. So I think that we've got some good partnerships across the board. Um, let me see, what else could I tell you? I personally think that it's actually a better looking phone. Uh, I have some, if you don't mind me flopping around a little bit here, a couple of the things that um, I hope I, um, I hope I still have it here. I hope I didn't take it out. That's actually our uh, our alarm system. Did I take it out? Oh, I might have taken it out. I probably did. Anyway, I have some slides where we actually compare iOS to Android to us. And so we made some very specific design choices and considerations to be a softer, um, to keep the kind of like tech spirit alive, but also be softer. Android's actually very kind of tech heavy. Um, and so for this group who's not tech heavy, you know, let's not be Windows, let's not be this, let's not be Android, let's be uh, rounder and softer and smoother but still sleek and still feel uh, modern. So all of those, why we have round, the round choices, all of these things are, are quite um, attractive. Uh, and, and that all plays into the phone too. I, I think the performance is, is, is very on par with um, with Samsung as well, a lot of the Samsung phones. So we're, we're okay. at time. Oh, we're at time. Um, and uh, I just want to be respectful of everybody who might have class they got to run to. So, you know, I know you had a question. Happy to take it afterwards. And anybody else who wants to talk to us, we're more than happy to stick around for however long you want us to be here, basically. Um, but I just want to be mindful of everybody else yeah, who might have a class that. they need to run to.